Henry Graff here at the command post where a manhunt is underway for Matthew Carver. Three updates right now from police. An unlawful assembly has been declared and Virginia State Police are now out here on the scene. They're clearing the streets. But neighbors tell me several men just opened fire on each other in the middle of the street with children around. He says the city's lying about the facts, about the numbers. Albemarle County Fire Rescue Crews have the fire under control here right now in this part of Albemarle County. Let me take a step out of the way so you can see the extent of the damage here. We were just allowed up here to this area to be able to see the damage. The house is a total loss. A Charlottesville police source does confirm that they do have police body cam footage from Jeff Fogel's late night arrest. I know you told me earlier uh, people were throwing, was it con bottles full of concrete at each other? What were some of the things happening back and forth there? We'll let you take a look inside. The mayor actually had to cancel the regular portion of this meeting so that people could basically have an airing of grievances here tonight. The numbers are changing for Albemarle County schools, and that's good news. What was once anywhere between a two and three million dollar budget deficit projected for the upcoming year is now cut in half. Mayor Mike Signer will accept the Defender of Democracy Award along with the people of Charlottesville. And the executive vice president of the Thomas Jefferson Foundation confirms they are a victim of a ransomware attack. But I am told through my sources that this case could go federal, depending on these other victims that they might find through all their investigations within, say, 60 to 90 days. We'll let you take a look inside. The mayor actually had to cancel the regular portion of this meeting so that people could basically have an airing of grievances here tonight. People are still here. They are yelling at city council. They are yelling at the city manager. The mayor had to flee at one point of this meeting with calls for his resignation. It is very clear here. The emotion about what happened nine days ago is still very raw. It ended before it got off the ground. A protest erupted inside Charlottesville City Council chambers Monday night as councilors held their first meeting since deadly violence played out in city streets on August 12th. Day, 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 day. They were angry. Y'all had multiple opportunities to intervene and you did not intervene one time. We told y'all exactly what y'all needed to do and y'all did nothing. They demanded answers. You want to call yourselves the capital of the resistance? No. The resistance was the medics who saved lives. <laughs> The resistance they are the citizens who are identifying the perpetrators of hate crimes. They wanted someone held accountable. Somebody's got to be held accountable for not only the blood of those three lives, but for every injury that happened this past weekend. And I will be damned if I see another one of my brothers or sisters get beaten or die. At one point, counselors and city staff fled the room as protesters jumped up where council sits with a banner saying, blood on your hands. If you guys can't do your job and protect these people, because this is my extended family right here. If you can't do it, I'm going to get somebody together and we going to. Charlottesville police officers flooded council chambers in an attempt to keep the crowd calm. But it backfired. Three people were hauled out and arrested. You can drag citizens out of here, your officers, and look at the officers you brought here tonight versus who is usually here. What kind of statement are you all making? Back out here live at City Hall tonight, the line to talk before City Council is still very long here inside Council Chambers. The crowd did call for those three people who are arrested to be released. The vice mayor said at one point, Vice Mayor West Bellamy said that he would work to intervene and have those people released. But I did talk with a police officer here in the end, Casey, who tells me that those three people were given summonses uh, for being disorderly here at City Council before everything erupted. Until now, we can only describe the confession tape for you, but tonight, the words straight from Hughley himself. He killed George. He killed her. She's dead. I think you knew that already. <laughs> It's 7.52 a.m. May 3rd, 2010, just 43 minutes before life was about to drastically change for University of Virginia star lacrosse player George Wesley Hughley, the All-American boy from Washington, D.C., who was about to go from the top of his game to convicted murderer. No, I mean, she was not screaming. Yeah. She should have been, probably. She 
was Yardley Love, a fourth-year student at UVA and lacrosse player who, just days earlier, Hughley called his girlfriend. I am investigating a case, all right, and you are being detained. Charlottesville Police Detective Lisa Best sat face-to-face -face with Hughley in the intense interrogation, hours after he broke into Love's 14th Street apartment, repeatedly shook her head against a wall, and left his ex-girlfriend face down in a pool of blood. Yeah, it was actually, it was locked, yeah. Because yeah. I think I put a hole. Yeah, you punched door. a hole through the door. Pretty sure, actually, now. Yeah, that okay. you said that, yeah. All right, what, sure. why'd you do that? Because I want to talk to her. Do you believe he just wanted to talk to her about their rocky relationship? I do believe his intention was to go there and talk to her at first. I think that with the alcohol and his temper, and once he got in there, I think once she told him that she didn't want to talk to him, I think that's when it escalated at that moment. Hours earlier, Hughley hit the links with his dad at Wintergreen. A full day of drinking gave way to dinner here at the CNO in downtown Charlottesville and even more alcohol. What happened next? When I was next, and she just kept hitting her head against the, against the wall while she was sitting on the bed, and I was like, and I grabbed her, and I like shook her, I was like, stop, like, we need to, like, and looked at her, I was like, we need to, like, talk about this, and like, I mean, I was on holding her arms and stuff. In my view, this statement was, was of central importance. Did you choke her at one point? Um, I may have grabbed her a little bit by the neck mm -hmm. when we were, like, but I never, like, strangled her. City prosecutor Dave Chapman secured the second-degree murder conviction against Hughley in 2012. During the trial, he played 63 minutes of the interrogation tape to the jury. On the one hand, was it premeditated? Uh, on the other hand, could you see in the interview uh, that, that the suspect was surprised? NBC 29 legal analyst Lloyd Snook says the confession wasn't Hughley's only issue at his trial. He could perfectly well uh, have defended the case if the facts, if the pictures weren't awful, if the if the medical injuries weren't awful. Ian Glumsky was on the jury that convicted Hughley. He declined to be re-interviewed about the tape, but says he hasn't wavered on what he said after the trial. When things start off, he's basically uh, a bad boy with his hand caught in the cookie jar. I mean, I'm in here for a soul charge. And then when they tell him that, uh, that Yardley's dead, it, there's a very big change in, in his demeanor. I want to see, I want to see her. George, look at me. George. She is dead. He would have had been a fantastic actor to pull off uh, the emotional responses that he did. Oh, she's dead. I found it very believable. Oh, no, no. No, I didn't know. I didn't know. I... Why didn't you know? Well, she's not dead. She's not dead. But seeing a live person suffering. And it didn't get out of control. She's not dead. She's not dead. She's not dead. There's no way she's dead. There's no way. I can't do it. No way. No way. That convinced me that he really had no idea First off, that at that point that she was dead, and then, then that, that kind of therefore means he didn't go over there with the intention to kill her. 22 year old, 22, and her life is done. Oh my God, kill me. It was very sad. You know, Yarley's life was taken away from her, and then George making a very stupid decision. <laughs> Fast forward. Just two weeks after this interrogation, Hughley, a fourth year, would have graduated from UVA and begin his career in real estate at a firm in Washington, D.C. A promising dream turned nightmare in the blink of an eye. <laughs> Hughley's final U.S. Supreme Court appeal was denied last month. He is serving a 23-year prison sentence right now at the Augusta Correctional Unit. Hughley declined a request for an interview on the story. The 28-year-old is set to be released from prison coming up in 2029. She says her voice was heard loud and clear. She cares about sexual assault survivors, and Rolling Stone got it plain wrong. It was vindicating. The colorama reflects on some of the darkest days of her people. life. And to say that, you know, I was wronged in some way, it felt, it felt really good in the end. 
but it was a very difficult process to get there. That difficult process for her own justice started last October, two years after the former University of Virginia associate dean was portrayed as indifferent to allegations of gang rape on grounds in a 2014 Rolling Stone article, a 9,000 word account of a brutal attack on a student named Jackie, a story that was later retracted by the magazine and debunked. Orama would file suit for defamation. Her day in court had finally come. I had a pump up song every day that I would ride to the courthouse in to, just to get ready. It was from Hamilton. It was that musical routine, along with the support of family and friends, that got Aramo through each grueling day inside the Charlottesville Federal Courthouse as she sought $7.5 million in damages from the magazine and its author, Sabrina Rubin Erdely. It was very difficult to sit, you know, 10 feet from Ms. Erdely while she testified every day. Um, I didn't anticipate how difficult that would be. Just the extent to which she spoke to my uh, students about, you know, feeling like I had I had acted inappropriately. Um, that was really difficult to hear. As was the magazine's lack of responsibility, even after a jury ruled in Aramo's favor and awarded her $3 million in damages. You go into that process hoping to get justice, hoping to get people to take responsibility for their actions. I never felt like that happened. And we felt like we were on the right side. I, I knew that I was telling the truth. That truth is what Aramo is holding on to, putting a very dark chapter in her life to rest and finally writing a new one, one she's in charge of. It felt like uh, it was finally at the end of a really long journey. Aramo says she doesn't blame Jackie here in the end. She saw Jackie actually during Jackie's videotaped deposition, which was played in the federal court. That was the first time they saw each other since the article came out. And the last, tonight at 11, we take a look at the good that is coming out of all of this. Hella Ramos taking money, donating money, starting a fund at the University of Virginia to fight against sexual violence all to a new level.